The other type of approach to intonation that I felt was genuinely new um, over the last few decades was discourse intonation. <coughs> Um, it's probably apparent to you already that I'm the kind of person that gets excited by new ideas and then later on gets disillusioned. Um, discourse intonation, again, I fell in love with when it came out. Um, and some of my colleagues thought that I was crazy. Um, certainly Jack Windsor Lewis thought that I had gone completely bananas. Uh, <laughs> um, but I thought that this was discovering or bringing up for the first time some things about intonation that needed to be said. Again, I've done this like a balance sheet. I put in what I like about it and then things that I feel disappointed with. <coughs> Firstly, I like the link with discourse analysis dealing with the, the if you like, the non-phonic um, aspects of language. Um, treating prosody in isolation from the linguistic material, from the syntactic structure, um, from the, uh, the discourse structure, uh, it's always a mistake, I think. It's very nice. And it, it, it was partly the, the academic environment in which this developed at Birmingham University, where discourse analysis was uh, uh, something that uh, uh, there was a great deal of expertise on, and the intonation side of it naturally grew out of an enthusiasm among a group of workers. That's the best kind of academic environment. It's much better than one person sitting in an office figuring out intonation privately for themselves. The observations about how speakers interact was much more sophisticated, much more profound than the kind of generalizations that you would find in a book like O'Connor and Arnold. In O'Connor and Arnold, I don't know how many of you have seen this, or um, other books more recently which take the same kind of approach, you might get statements like, um, the fall rise indicates uncertainty, politeness, uh, lack, of, uh, lack of confidence, um, or uh, a wish to indicate that something else is going to follow. Things like that, which is essentially unilateral. It's talking about what the speaker is doing and what the speaker is hoping to achieve uh, in, in using this. But the, that's a bit like describing a tennis game with only, talk, only talking about one player. The discourse intonation is much more like a, a, a tennis game where you're looking at both players, both sides of the net, and how they return the ball to each other, um, and uh, how they uh, can agree to make a decent game of it. Right from the start, it was obvious that this was something that would be easy to adopt as pedagogical material, that it might well be very helpful for learners, uh, to have an explanation of not only what the intonation form was, but how English speakers use it in, uh, uh, in productive ways. And something that not many people noticed, I think, but which I felt very positive about, was that this was designed to fit other accents of English. It wasn't just designed for RP. Those of you who know this, uh, will know that instead of writing lines to indicate rises and falls, uh, we have abstract symbols like P for proclaiming, R for referring. And that has to be mapped onto a particular pitch movement. If you were describing uh, an accent of English, or of another language, but let's stick with English, if you were describing an accent of English where proclaiming was not done with a falling tone, but with a rising one, for example, and uh, in Northern Ireland, you might well hear something like that. Um, you don't have to change the system of transcription. All you do is put a little note saying the proclaiming tone will be pronounced with a rising tone in this accent, not with a falling tone. So you can, you can put this onto a number of different accents, and you don't need to change the transcription system. So I thought that was a very positive um, aspect of it. But but uh, some things are not as good as they should be. Firstly, um, going back to what I was saying right at the beginning, there are many features of English intonation which have no place in the, uh, the transcription recommended for discourse intonation. Let me, let me take a, a, a particular um, example. Um, 
In the transcription, the use of key is very important. It's very important to know whether a speaker is, uh, is beginning pitch movements, for example, in the high part of their pitch range, in the middle part of their pitch range, or in the lower part. And uh, that is a very good observation. It's not original. It, it goes back to Henry Sweet, but it's, it's very good that this, this thing was, uh, was brought up. But many other aspects, uh, many other of the physical aspects of intonation, such as, uh, such as tempo, such as voice quality, um, are completely ignored. It's implied that we can convey uh, something like agreement or disagreement simply by the choice of high, mid, or low key. Uh, it's, it's an oversimplification that neglects many other features of intonation. So in, to that extent, I felt that it was not detailed enough. So most other prosodic features were excluded from the, uh, from the description. As far as I know, the promise of uh, extending this to other accents of English has not been followed up. I'm not aware of... Uh, I've heard one or two conference papers where discourse, uh, the discourse framework has been used on other accents, but only incidentally, and I don't think that this has really been followed through. It doesn't mean it's... Im it could perfectly well be done tomorrow or next week or in a year's time. It's not finished. But at the moment, there is not material that I would like to see on variety within accents. The transcription is rather difficult to do because it's done on, on different uh, layers. The O'Connor and Arnold system, for all of its faults, is very easy to use because it all appears on the same line. There's not, nothing above the line or below it. So uh, those are, sorry, I, I, I perhaps just uh, uh, skipped off that a bit too quickly. I don't know how those things balance out. Uh, I feel that discourse intonation is not moving ahead as fast as it was when it was new, but it's certainly not dead. Um, I'm not saying that these uh, cancel each other out to a zero. Um, it may well be still that the advantages of the discourse intonation approach are, uh, outweigh, are more important than the complaints that I've made here. Most of the things that I've said are disadvantages could be put right without wrecking uh, or demolishing the system. I think in terms of Toby um, and I'm sorry that I didn't have time to give you a proper idea of what it's like. In, as far as I'm concerned, Toby has been so much um, mangled and, and wounded uh, that it's not any longer practical, it's no longer something that I would want to work with. And I, I rather regret now the years that I spent uh, trying to become an expert on it. But with discourse intonation, I think there is still a future there and uh, we should not abandon at least the good bits of it. Maybe we want to get rid of some of the things that uh, are not so attractive. <laughs>